Good morning, everyone. Um, morning. Uh, a very warm welcome to church. It's a lovely sunny day out there, isn't it? A little bit fresh, but uh, very pleasant all the same. Um, I do have uh, some additional notices this morning, um, in, in addition to what you've seen on the screen and uh, relating to the handouts that everybody received uh, this morning. So I'll just go over that uh, quickly. Uh, just to give everybody a, an overview of it. So progress towards the union of the Kinrosha churches is progressing well at the moment. Paperwork uh, that you've already received on the way into church this morning has been handed out to all congregations today, actually, um, for everybody to read over ahead of the vote that will take place, the congregational vote, that is, that will take place on the 17th of November. Uh, and we would really encourage everybody to read through that information as soon as you can, and if you've got any questions, please do let us know. Uh, any of the elders should be able to help with that. If not, they'll be able to point you in the right direction, because it'd be great to be able to answer any questions before the meeting uh, and the vote on the, on the 17th. Um, so I'll just briefly go over what the timetable is. So all of the Kirk sessions will be meeting on the afternoon of Sunday the 3rd of November. Uh, so that's Foss Fossaway, Cleish, Orwell and Pope Moak, and Kinross. Uh, and th so there's initial votes by, uh, by the sessions, first of all, and then it's the congregational vote on Sunday the 17th, uh, and that will take place at the normal worship times. So the vote for this church, Orwell and Port Moak, uh, will take place in this building, and it will be on at 10.30 on the, the 17th. And the vote will take place at the beginning of the service, uh, rather than at the end, because that group of people who are recording the vote then need to move on to Kinross. Uh, after that as well so that'll be at 10 30 so two requests there one i uh, would ask everybody um if we could be there on time for that 10 31 that would be fantastic and of course we're looking for as big a turnout as possible uh, for that uh, for that vote to take place um i'll just go briefly over what the questions are i'm not going to go over the questions in detail but just the the outline of them uh, the first question is about the basis of union that's the formal coming together of all of the kirk sessions that we've been talking about for quite a number of months now. The second one is the basis of team ministry, how uh, details of how the ministry will be exercised in the United Parish. The third one is the basis of renewable tenure, a requirement to allow flexibility to the, to the presbytery in making future changes more easily to respond to changing circumstances. So as things change, just having enough flexibility to adapt with those changes. And then the fourth one is to accept uh, formally accept Reverend Alan Reid as the minister and moderator of the, of the combined Kinrosha parish. So those are the outline of the four questions, but the detail is very much in the handout that everybody's received this morning. Um, so I'm going to say that date one more time. It's uh, the 17th of November and it's at 10.30 here. The vote will take place at the beginning of the service to allow those, uh, the Pestbridge folks to move on to Kinross Church after that. And one last thing to mention is a thanks to everyone who was involved in the organisation, uh, in including the cooking uh, of uh, the Stovey's lunch, which happened last weekend for Mombly, and a grand total of £452.68 was raised. So a thank you and a well done t on those counts. Thanks. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. When we don't have all the answers, when everything is going wrong around us, when we don't have words to express our pain, when others let us down, we can still be faithful to God. For God is faithful to us and we can be faithful to him. Let's sing a song that is well known in this parish, immortal, invisible, God only wise. <laughs>
Let us pray. Lord God, as we come to you in our needs, we recognize you to be a God of compassion and grace. And you have given us your word of truth. And so we come to you with praise and thanksgiving this morning, for you are the Lord of all creation. You are unfathomable, God. And we feel so small beside your greatness. Lord, help us to trust in you, to hold on to your steadfast love and to your faithfulness. We want to praise you even when we don't understand you. So, Lord, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, to listen to your word in faith and obedience. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who brings us to your throne in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I'd like to just say a few words about not just today, but the next two Sundays. Because this Sunday we're beginning a three-week series through the book of Job. Obviously that will take us through to the end of October and we'll conclude it on our Harvest Sunday celebration at the end of the month. The book of Job is a story about how to react to trouble, what to do when trouble comes. It's not easy reading. The Old Testament book is classed as wisdom literature. In other words, it's like the book of Proverbs in the Bible that offers us practical, down-to-earth perspectives on dealing with everyday life. The story of Job looks at human tragedy and it forces us to reflect on life and to ask questions. And I, I sincerely hope that it will do that for us too. Martin Luther, the reformer, once described the book of Job as magnificent and sublime as no other scripture. I don't know why he said that, but I think it may be because it raises the question of our relationship to God when we experience extreme suffering. It has to be said that few people experience the level of suffering that Job did. And so I want to make uh, 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 an invitation to you. I want to encourage you this month in the light of this, I want you to try to find time at home to read through the book of Job. It's not going to be quick reading. It's 42 chapters altogether. But take time to try to read it either at a single sitting, be an afternoon or an evening, or to split it into three as we're splitting it into three here in Orwell Parish. Chapters 1 to 3, which we're looking at this morning. Chapters 4 to 37, which is the substantial part of Job and his friends talking about suffering. Or, and, and then finally, the third part, chapters 38 to 42, which provides the climax. I think it would be well worth it. Now, Lachlan, I, I've just made uh, an executive decision. We're, we're not going to have a junior church message this morning. I need the time for something else. But we will sing, I'm special because God has loved me. <laughs>
Here's the word of God. In the land of us, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going to and fro on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then. Everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the eldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were ploughing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the eldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Thanks be to God. Let's worship God as we sing a song about suffering written by William Cowper. God moves in a mysterious way.
So, the story of Job. And what a story it is. And I do hope you'll take the time to read something which, though you've read it before, will come across to you, I'm sure, very fresh. And it could even be quite an exciting experience. The story of Job is about a man who loses everything, his wealth, his health, and his family. Disaster strikes right at the heart of his family when a, uh, at the house of his eldest brother, Job's family, comes to a tragic end. We know certain things about him as he's described in chapter 1 as a wealthy man in verse 3, for example, telling us that he's well healed. Elsewhere, the Bible talks about him as a shining example of goodness, Ezekiel chapter 14, and an example of patience, James chapter 5. But here in this first chapter, he's also described as a man of faith, verse 5. It says that he prayed for his children every day. Do you pray for your children every day? That's what a person of faith does. And then, out of the blue, suffering came. It began on a day like any other day. And then he heard all his oxen all his donkeys had gone, stolen. Their herders were slaughtered. That all his sheep had been destroyed in a natural disaster. That all his camels had been stolen and their drivers killed by raiders. And then came the awful news that all his children had been killed by a further natural disaster. As you can imagine, his heart became heavy. His mind became numb. His body was covered with horrible sores. And covered in these red spots from head to foot, it seems Job tried to bring relief by taking a piece of pottery to scratch himself, just to relieve the pain. Job had been reduced to a revolting sight. And he had no idea what was happening to him. He had no idea why it was happening to him. All he could do was to withdraw from life, shave his head, tear off his clothes. And sometimes that is what has to happen. I think none of you in this auditorium, this church building today, are exempt from an experience similar to that. You've experienced suffering, whether it's to do with your health, your wealth, or your family. You've experienced deep loss. And, you know, sometimes it just has that numbing effect when you just have to withdraw, you just have to take it, and you just have to bear it. This may be a heavy subject for a Sunday morning, but I think it's a really important one in our day and age, in our Western world. And so chapters 1 to 3 that we're looking at briefly this morning Take us behind the scenes, so to speak, to scenes of suffering. They take us to what I might call a spiritual world of angels, chapter chapter 1, verses 6 to 12. It's a kind of window into a metaphysical world. It's similar, if you like, maybe I can give an example, to the book by C.S. Lewis, a remarkable book that he wrote many, many years ago called Screwtape Letters. And the Screwtape Letters imagined a series of writings from a senior devil 
to a junior devil. The, the senior devil's name was given as Screwtape, and his nephew, Wormwood, was the junior devil, who was being advised on how to lead a man into damnation. The Bible text, you know, in Job that we read this morning is not that similar, not so dissimilar. Here, what we have, however, is not from a senior devil to a junior devil, but from a conversation between God and the devil. The name Satan in Job literally means the accuser. That is what the devil does. He accuses. And anyone who's experienced mental health suffering, anyone who's experienced uh, difficulty uh, like this will often know how you feel accused. And you imagine all sorts of things that you've done wrong, many things that you've said that are wrong. And the conversation here in Job chapter 1 ends with God giving permission for the Satan to touch all things that belong to Job, except Job himself. He, uh, the, we read just now, he puts a, a hedge around Job. But what we are introduced to here is something quite alarming, and it's the personification of evil, the personification in Satan, verse 6. And I have to say that because a kind of common view today is that when you start talking about Satan or the devil, that's really not real. It's simply a way that we imagine ancient peoples had of explaining evil and suffering. I want to say that the Bible takes the devil seriously as a being, a spiritual being, that exists as a personal organizer of evil. And that evil is relentless. And as the organizer of evil, one of his great tricks is to say that he isn't. He's a deceiver. He says, I don't exist. He'd rather make, have people make a figure of fun out of him, uh, make himself a, uh, a figure for folklore and storybooks. And, and it's not lost on us, I think, that even in this fortnight, supermarkets are selling masks and makeup so that this month children can dress up as demons at Halloween. The Bible takes the subject of Satan very seriously. In fact, it even provides a kind of identikit of the devil. It reveals how he began as an angel who rebelled because he wanted to be like God. And the scriptures go on to portray Satan as using two special images. One, an image of a serpent, a slinking, evasive wretch. And it appears in Genesis chapter 1 to 3. And then the picture of a lion, a roaring, terrifying lion, 1 Peter chapter 5. These two images kind of sum up how the devil works. He slinks, he maneuvers, he does things in a very cunning way. And yet he can at the same time roar and terrify anyone who stands to face him. I expect this is not new to many of you, but let me say that in World War II in North Africa, the tent of the Allied commander, Field Marshal Montgomery, had a massive photograph of the enemy, a picture of General Rommel, the desert fox, was pinned up on the side of his caravan. And afterwards, Montgomery explained that he wanted to be regularly reminded every day of why he was in the desert and of the enemy that he faced. And the point is that when fighting a war, 
It's important to know your enemy. In some ways today, we live in a world that is breaking itself apart on a national, global scale. And in a, even in our communities, we break ourselves apart. And it's important to recognize this is not simply human malaction. It's not what we call simply sin. There is also the dynamic of Satan involved in it, stirring, leading, causing. It's very important to recognize that we live in different times. And when you look back on your life and think about how you coped during difficult days of suffering, how God was with you, but in a different way to who he is today. Our times are in God's hands. I want to take a moment just now, because this is a heavy subject. I, I want to take time just now for us to stay where you are, sit, sit sitting, and sing with me a hymn that is no longer in our hymn book. It, it was in uh, two previous versions of the Church of Scotland hymn book. It's called My Times are in your hands. Let's sing three of the five verses. Thank you, Rosemary. Our times are in God's hands. That's an important thing to hold on to when trouble comes. Because sometimes bad things happen to good people. I want you just to reflect on the way things are just now in the world, the pain, the isolation of innocent families and people in Ukraine, in Gaza, Israel, Sudan, Myanmar, we could go on. And you begin to ask the question, where is God in all this? Where is God in all this? Is this how bad one humanity can get? I dare to say that many years ago a church leader was asked, where is God when one and a half million people, mostly Jews, died at the former Nazi death camp at Auschwitz? And when he was speaking at the Birkenau section of the camp where Jews had been led from trains to be gassed and cremated, he said this, he said, it's almost impossible to speak in this place of horror. So 
Sometimes it's just about silence, isn't it? Let me say this, though. God is rarely totally silent, but there are dark times when it's almost impossible for us to sing. And the book of, book of Job helps us to get a grip on this dimension of life and death. It doesn't give us easy answers, but I, I don't think you expected it to. What it does do, and I hope it will do for us all here in Orwell Church, is to open up a way for people of faith to talk about it, to talk about our experience, to reflect on it. So in the remaining moments that we have just now, I want to turn to the first two chapters of the story. <clears throat> we read the first one. And these chapters be behind, uh, reveal the situation behind Job's troubles and suffering. They reveal the hidden activity of the spiritual powers in high places. Satan is revealed as taking time out from his normal activity of roaming the earth. And the picture is of what I said earlier, of relentless evil, of re the relentless nature of evil in the world. And Satan is behind it. Satan tells God that the reason that he's protecting Job and his family was so that somehow Job would then obey him and never curse him. This is a tactic, a temptation that Satan has. He sneers cynically, saying, does Job fear God for nothing? Verse 9. At first, that seems a, a fair question. Do we love God? for what we can get rather than for who he is. Worship God for himself. You see what is happening here? What Satan is really doing is to cast doubt on the goodness of God, to cast doubt on the love of God. Especially when we face trouble and tragedy. What he wants is for us to curse God, to blame God, to charge God with responsibility for all that is going on. You might say this, that faith faces its toughest test when God seems more like an enemy than a friend, more like darkness than light. But you see, it's a devilish illusion that we're being led into here. And furthermore, Satan even used the one closest to him, his wife. In chapter 2, verse 9, Job's wife has just lost all her children and is hurting as she sees her husband in such pain. She doesn't understand why Job was suffering, but she loved him and hurts with him. And when she sees her husband in excruciating agony, scraping his oozing sores with a piece of broken pottery, it's more than she can handle. Job's wife tells him to end it all. Curse God. Be done with it. Curse God and die. Now, for Job, that must have been the worst of all. But he understood that his life was in God's hands. The remarkable thing is that Job did not curse God. He understood his life was in God's hands and his life wasn't his to take. You know, that's a very difficult thing when you're under huge mental pressure, huge uh, mental stress. In the middle of the battle, sometimes you have to hold on to basic truths and not try to analyze them too much, but just hold on to them and not let them go. Such as this, Job's clear thought, key thought in all this, was something that he utters. He says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Hold on to that. 
Hold on to that. My times are in God's hands. Hold on to that. Hold on to it. And in the middle of battle, of the battle, Job refuses to blame God. But in his experience, he takes it very hard. Chapter 3 goes on to reveal the day that Job curses when he was born. When he curses the day he was born, quarrels and longs for death. And if I can quote the end of the chapter, just to give you a flavor of what he says, he says, for sighing has become my daily food. My groans pour out like water. What I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, but only turmoil. An agony. I want you, just as you're thinking about this and trying to picture the scene, compare this description of Job with the hideous picture that we're given in Isaiah 52 of the suffering servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of this prophecy, who is described as his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. You see, God never explains himself. It's very interesting that Job didn't know what we know. Job hadn't heard the conversations between Satan and God. He hadn't heard anything from God because God never explains himself. What we know today, Job could not have known because we live on the other side of Christ's coming, of Christ's death and resurrection. Unlike Job, we can look back on how Jesus suffered. We can think back to why he suffered. We can look back to the cross, see from his head, his hands, his feet. Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? or thorns compose so rich a crown. You see, we are benefic benefits of the New Testament story. And yet, curiously and very strangely, even then, without all this information, with this knowledge, Job somehow could look beyond the grave and know that he would meet God. Because in chapter 19 of Job, we read these words, these words that are on our stained glass window here in Orwell Church. In Job chapter 19, verse 25, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed and apart from my flesh, I shall see God. Isn't that remarkable? That he could look beyond the grave. He didn't curse God, but he could envision God's appearance before him. His confidence was hugely tested. Job remained utterly perplexed. And as we said, God never explains himself. But in the cross, even for us, the Lord doesn't provide security from the storms of life. We still suffer. We still experience tragedy. But God does give us security in 
those storms. That's the point. In those storms, the Lord comes to us. The Lord is, is alongside us. Jesus suffered to destroy the power of evil and of the devil. And while that battle rages on in the world, let's be clear, as God's people, we will be faithful to God. And we will not give in to the prince of death, but we will trust in the prince of life in the one in whose hands we are. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for coming, for living and dying and rising again. And we thank you that you are with us in our deepest darkness and suffering even when we can't see you or understand. You are a God who walks alongside us in our pain. Bear with us, Lord, as we try to live for you in all that we do. Help us to keep you in our hearts and minds and to walk in faithfulness with you. And as we follow your way, Lord, in your mercy, help us to keep our feet on the ground so that wherever we find ourselves, we will bless and not curse you. Hear us, Lord, as we give ourselves to you now, as we bring to you our offerings and our sacrifices, as we give to you our gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. A short song, a chorus called There is a Redeemer.
Let us pray. As we come to the end of Challenge Poverty Week, let us not think that now we can move on thinking the problems of the poor have been solved. We pray for those who have no security in life, who experience financial hardship and struggle to make ends meet, who are in debt, whose store cupboards and fridge are empty, and who have to choose between fuel and food. We pray for the stress poor physical and mental health that injustice helps create. We pray for the struggling neighbourhoods of Scotland and beyond. And we pray that the people of our churches can help each other to lift the weight of the desperate and infirm and give them hope. We pray for our community, for the unemployed, for those who are, for those who are employed but are in low pay, for those who need to use the food bank for basic supplies, for those people whose housing is below standard. Lord of justice and peace, we pray for people living in such poverty that as well as being hungry, they feel stripped of dignity and self-worth with little choice in how to live or plan their lives. People who are existing rather than living unable to fully participate in society. You know and love each and every one of us. We thank you for organisations such as Broke Not Broken, The Day Centre, Kinrosher Volunteer Drivers, Common Ground, who work to transform lives, reducing people's debt and delivering vital services. We thank you for befrienders, debt advisors, street pastors, job clubs. We pray for our government, grant our politicians wisdom and compassion and a sense of justice. Not just to support these groups and organizations, but to build a society that doesn't need them, doesn't need a food bank because people can afford to look after themselves with dignity. Fill us with the love to love our neighbours. Give our hearts of compassion to stir, to stir us to act on their behalf and give from what we have to provide for their needs. We pray for an end to poverty and deprivation for a time when people can not just live but thrive. When people can pray, give us this day our daily bread knowing that they can thank you, the God who provides. Let us pray for a just and more equal society. Amen. And we now play the, say the Lord's Prayer. Sorry. Let's close our worship as we sing about the suffering of Christ, as we think about the cross, when I survey the wondrous cross.
And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and always. <laughs>